Church family, good morning. My name is Brian Hoover. I'll be doing our scripture reading today. So if you could turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're using the Pew Bibles, you'll find this on page 897. You can also follow along on either of the screens. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll be starting in verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, only a few times before the sermon, I've come up here and I've said something like, as we get into this, it might be helpful to talk about this theme or that theme. And so just take a moment and five, six minutes and talk with those sitting by you in the pews. And sometimes I think that helps as we articulate what we think about a passage or how we've experienced it. It helps us get ready to hear what God has to say about it. This this morning, as we've been doing, we've been preaching through 1 Corinthians, and we come this week to a passage where our team of pastors, really any team of pastors, would have marked this passage many weeks out before the series and said, this is one of several across 1 Corinthians that should be handled with extra care. This morning, we've come to a, upon the strange case of sexual sin and the theme of church discipline, so no, it will not be a week where I say, hey, turn, turn to your neighbors and just talk about how you've experienced this. If you're new with us, and we don't have experience together much, at least, of saying hard things or discussing hard things, what I want to just say, and then I'll pray, is that, that we, we try here, we try to say hard things in a way that reckons with the seriousness of God, the seriousness of his word, the seriousness of us as his people, but at the same time also believing that all truth is good truth and that in Jesus Christ we have become children of a good heavenly father and whatever he has to say is there again for our good. So whether you're new, whether you're old, that's my heart. Would you join me in prayer as we begin? Heavenly Father, we do pray again, echoing, I believe what were Mike's words, to give us ears, give us hearts that are open. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be better at this than me, but I, I find it possible to lose the plot of a story. Uh, even with a good television show, good writers, um, I might lose the plot. Now, if you're binge watching a show, it's difficult to, you know, they follow one right after another. And so it's more difficult to lose the plot, at least in a good show, but sometimes the show can lose the plot. That's a different thing. But when you watch a little bit here and a little bit there, it can be difficult to remember. I would say even if you watch this 90-minute movie over three, minute, <laughs> three nights, and one night you go to Lancaster to watch sports, your kids' sports, and another night you'd have church meetings, it can be possible, even in a 90-minute movie, to forget, like, why is this marriage so hard? <laughs> What, 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 why are they upset? Who assassinated the president? Why did they assassinate the president? Why did they go back in time to get the affinity stones? And why are there 142 Marvel movies? I, I don't know. I've lost the plot. Now, that, that can be a little funny if you're a Marvel fan. Maybe not a little too on the nose. Um... But when it comes to God's grand story of redemption and a congregation losing the plot, 
It can be tragic to lose the gospel plot line. The gospel plot line of God's grand story of redemption goes like this. It's how a holy God redeems an unholy people through the costly death of his son on the cross and causes them to walk in increasing holiness by the power of his Holy Spirit so that one day when he returns, he will make his holy new heavens and earth here on earth where they're protected, where we're protected forever from anything unholy. That's the gospel plot line. And in our day, just as in Corinth, there can be lots of ways to lose this gospel plot line. And when we do lose it, all kinds of things go wrong. And so that's why when we gather each week, we come to remember this story. Who we are, who God is. This church in Corinth had lost the plot. And God wanted to help get it back. So if you have 1 Corinthians open, I encourage you to leave it open whether in the Pew Bible, Bible you brought, on your phone, whatever it would be, 1 Corinthians chapter one verse, excuse me, chapter five, verse one, we're going to talk about the narrow way. The, the narrow way this man's sin was causing problems, and we'll go to the wider concerns. The, but here we'll start with the narrow concern in this loss of plot. It is actually reported, Paul writes, that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife there it is a few times paul in this letter refer, refers to a report chapter 11 or chapter 1 verse 11 chapter 11 verse 18 there's mention of a report you see paul had planted this church stayed among them for 18 months and then moved on to other church planning ministry. And while away, he gets this report that speaks of the many blessings and the giftedness of this local congregation, and which undoubtedly made him happy. But he, there's challenges also in this report. And part of this report says, apparently, that a prominent member in their congregation lives with his stepmother as though they were married. The sin is present tense and ongoing, which is why Paul describes the man as has. He has his father's wife. I think it's worded that way to communicate to stepmom. We hope. Now this could sound a little better than it does, perhaps. Maybe the father is dead. The father may have divorced his stepwife either before or after he died. I mean, he would have had to have done it before he died, but like maybe whether before he's still alive. The step. Wife might be quite young, and so about the same age as the son. Maybe the father himself was quite a jerk, and they never really had much of a marriage. We know none of that. It's only guesses. And if some of this is true, it might make us say, well, okay, perhaps. Maybe that's a little more understandable. And yet there's nothing that makes it acceptable. This relationship is strictly forbidden in the Old Testament, Leviticus 18, and even in Greek culture. And that's Paul's point. It's that even in Corinth, among pagans, this was unacceptable. Just, just let that sink in for a moment. When we began the sermon series through 1 Corinthians a few months ago, I equated the city of Corinth to two cities, um, Baltimore in a way because it's a port city, Corinth was, Baltimore is. But I also equated it to Las Vegas, a city famous for sexual sin. And see Paul's words here again. There is sexual immorality among you, he says, of a kind not even tolerated among pagans. People don't do that in Vegas, he says. Now, I want to be careful, but I think it's helpful to name a few things here by kind of telling the story of, of, of two kind of flags that churches might fly. On the one hand, there's a rainbow flag singling full support of LGBTQIA plus issues. And those issues are generally supported by the secular kind of world. So that's, it's, it's unsurprising. But I would say that even particularly LGBT with T, even in the secular world, it's a bit different. 
Biological men playing in women's sports, particularly violent sports like boxing and MMA, is still abhorrent to many. And then consider the T from a medical standpoint, particularly with children. Some of the most progressive countries in Western, Northern Europe, far further than, along than the U.S. in many progressive areas, the medical communities are going, this is tantamount to child abuse, to move families along in gender sex altering procedures. Even the Swedes are going, that's crazy, if you understand what I'm saying. So that's one way this could go. I will say, there is another flag, the Make America Great flag again. Now, I think there's a lot of great reasons that people could have to vote for any president. Perhaps they could come up with all sorts of great reasons, particularly the one we just elected. 50 million people had a lot of reasons. It's great. Secular world can understand that. It makes sense. Here's some reasons. What is confusing, what is confusing is unbridled enthusiasm, unqualified, unnuanced fan club. That's confusing to the secular world for the people who 10 years ago were frustrated that one president was characterized in messianic language. They were like, that's wrong. And 20 years ago, seem to say that character mattered. That's confusing to the secular world. Again, we have a wonderful country. We just had Veterans Day last week. So thankful for this country and the men and women who have led it and continue now to lead it in such a polarizing time. I don't want their job. <laughs> um, but what I'm trying to say is there's ways churches can lose the plot line. And that's the concern. That's the concern. But it's not actually Paul's biggest concern. For all this talk of this man's sin in verse 1, that's not even close to his main concern. Look again at verses 1 and 2. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even, not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant? Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. You see, don't you, that Paul's chief concern is, is not worried about this man and his sin. The stakes are higher. There's more on the line. Look at it like this. Consider a hospital. Now this hospital's made up, but on some random Sunday afternoon, a man shows up in the emergency room and he's feeling nauseous and he's felt nauseous for many days. First it was only fatigue, then fever, then loss of appetite, and now nausea, abdominal pain, and he's got this rash that keeps bleeding. It's awful, right? The medical staff begins to examine him and they learn that he recently traveled out of the country for business. They look at his symptoms, they ask questions, they run tests. A few hours later, they realize it's Ebola. Highly contagious virus. Someone alerts the media. A few hours later, the news reports, reporters arrive, pressing into different parts of the hospital, interviewing patients, staff, and so on. Cameras are rolling. Now, the media expected to be disturbed when they arrived. This is a disturbing situation. It's concerning to the public. They had no idea how disturbed they would be. Why? Because no one at the hospital was concerned. No one had put on a hazmat suit. No one had been quarantined in various wings of the hospital. No one had put up Ziploc and taped things off or whatever they do. I, and, and, and not only that, well, actually, the interviews at the media, this hospital president, he's boasting about how unafraid, and the nurses and doctors are, well, it's well and good that they're unafraid, but they're just in the cafeteria all eating together to show how unconcerned they are about the situation. Everything is under control. Do you see? Paul's chief's concern is that they are unconcerned. 
The church in Corinth would like to fashion it as their humility that causes them not to judge. Look how tolerant we are. But is it our humility before a holy God that would cause us to so fragrantly, not fragrantly, (laughs) such a serious point I was going to make there, (laughs) that God flagrantly disobey him It's not our humility that would cause us to do that. What they describe as humility, Paul names rightly as arrogance. Ought you not rather to mourn, he asks. The imagery of a hospital, I believe, is helpful. We can speak of the church not as a holy huddle, but as a hospital for sinners. I love that. You should love it too. I think of the words of Jesus, come to, you know, I, have came, I, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Luke 5, 32. I love those words. Praise God for them. But what does the full statement say? I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, 32. He's calling us to something. And let's not forget that it's a hospital for sinners. Yes and amen, but it's a hospital where people are supposed to get better. Paul's concern is that the church's very existence is on the line. In the book of Revelation, Jesus speaks, when he's speaking to his churches, he says, I might remove your lampstand, speaking metaphorically of snuffing them out. A lot is at stake for this church, but that's not even it. The reputation of the gospel is on the line, which is even more important. The gospel plot line, how a holy God redeems an unholy people, causing them to walk in increasing holiness until one day he dwells with them forever in holiness, free from anything unholy. That's the gospel plot line. That plot line is in question, going back to the hospital with this case of Ebola, we're all very concerned for this man's treatment, I would think. And we're all very concerned for the others in the hospital, we would think. But we're also very concerned for everyone in the community who will hear about this hospital and wonder, if I go there, what kind of treatment am I going to get? Will I actually be cared for? Will I actually get better? To make it more particular to us, I I love the opening lines we use in our worship service. Will we use them forever? No, forever is a long time. Have we updated them, tweaked them, modified a few times? Yes, but right now we say something like, to the weak who are tired and need strength, to the wounded who are broken and long to be whole, to the wayward who have strayed from God's good law of love, we, meaning in some ways, membership all to each other, but we who are on stage, we who have prayed, we who have prepared, we welcome you in the name of the living Jesus. That's what we say. I like that because it can be spoken over Christians and non-Christians alike. Jesus is welcoming anyone who would come. You're willing from a heart level? You want to come? You can get in on this. And it's important even for Christians to be reminded that though we might feel needy and we might have strayed from God's good law of love or whatever, in this way it encourages, I think, present tense faith, not simply a past decision, which is the emphasis in the New Testament. To, now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul writes. Present tense faith, that's the big deal. And the lines, they fit with the gospel arc, the gospel plot line of our service. We're welcome in, we're made aware of God and how he's welcoming us. But then we sing a song often that draws our attention to who God is and we're like, oh wow, but I'm also a sinner and we confess sins and then we receive his assurance of pardon and and we're reminded, oh yeah, God does love us even though we're sinners. And then we hear prayer and we preach and we're like, oh, how then do we live? And then we're sent out with a benediction, go and love and serve his world. That's a gospel arc to our service. So I like that. I think it's helpful. But a bad takeaway would be 
That if someone came in week in, week out, and to hear our opening words, weak, wounded, and wayward, and said, well, just stay there. D- don't ever change. Jesus doesn't change us. That would be losing the plot line and concerning. Now, thinking back to Paul's letter, talk about the narrow concern, the broad concern, concerns. Well, what are, what, how, do they, how are they going to recover the plot? How is he going to help this man, this church, this reputation for the gospel? Well, he wants us to follow the same plan. It's, it, it's actually the same plan Jesus gave his followers when he was here on earth. We generally refer to it by the name of church discipline, the Lord Jesus. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of, in the day of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> I think we could be distracted by the provocative language, deliver the man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. I'll come back to that later. But don't miss the end. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord. Paul is saying Jesus is coming back and this man may die first or Jesus may come back. But either way, he will give an account to a holy God for his sins. And when he gives that account, the only way he will be saved is if Jesus had died on the cross for his sins and this man had received that forgiveness. And right now, whether the gospel has been applied to his heart is really ambiguous, so ambiguous that we need to wake him up. It might be a Christian, he might be a Christian and he might not, but but we've got to wake him up because we're worried and we love him. And since this was 60 AD, his eternity began. A lot of years ago. As well one day you, yours and mine, which is sobering. This handing over to Satan and putting out of the church is a way to say the real issue is not any particular sexual sin. It never really is. It's an issue of the lordship of Jesus. Jesus is, is, is not merely handing out forgiveness. He is handing out forgiveness. But he's also becoming the lord of our lives. And if you want forgiveness from Jesus, which you should want, I would hope you would want, as we should, then we must also want him to be Lord. And even when it's uncomfortable, and this passage in 1 Corinthians 5, I believe, presumes that we're familiar with Jesus' words on church discipline, famously Matthew 18. So we got to read it. So I didn't look at which page it is. Matthew 18. If you want to flip over with me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it looks to be about 700 something. Matthew 18, um, read verses 15, it's on 773. Read, read six verses here, 15 through 20. We'll make a few comments and I'll preach a few more minutes and we'll, we'll come towards a close. Matthew 18, we're starting verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. These are Jesus' words. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you and that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if Two of you agree on earth about anything. They ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to borrow the summary of this, these verses. um, Because it was just said so succinctly from another pastor named Jeremy Treat. He was preaching in 1 Corinthians 5 and went over to Matthew 18 as we are and had this summary, four, four things. First, the context is family. This passage mentions brothers, meaning brothers and sisters. This implies family, the family of faith. 
If you think about 1 Corinthians 5, the, the woman is not named in the passage, presumably because she's not a member of the church. Pastor Ron's going to be finishing this chapter next week. And Paul shifts, but really stays on theme to talk about, well, we're not judging those outside the world, but in the church. He's going to talk about that nuance there, and I think that's why the woman is not named. She's not a member of the church. So again, the context is, both, is, is family, both in Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5. Second, the process is gradual. How many people get involved? As many as possible. No. As few as possible. Third, the motivation is love. For those, we, we, we care about them. It's love. That's, that's what drives all this. Fourth, the motivation is also restoration. The, the goal is to gain a brother, Jesus said. The goal is to keep people in church, not send them away. The goal is to see souls saved on the day of our Lord. So it's family, it's gradual, it's love, it's restoration. Now back to the Ebola case in hospitals. Imagine the patient did need care from the hospital. Imagine the hospital was the only place you could get healing. It's not the hospital could take all the credit for it. It's like the medicine was given to them, praise God. But that makes the hospital somewhat of a special place. They have the medicine. And it's appropriate for the hospital to tell the patient that they'd love to treat him and they'd love to work with him, but that he has to also stop doing the things he were doing that caused the thing that they has to be treated. And they'll even help him stop doing that thing. But if he refuses their help and chooses to infect others, he's got to leave the hospital. Now that should have a devastating effect in some ways. You would hope it would cause the person to reckon with and, and, and it, would, it would be framed a little bit differently. It's not that the church was kicking him out. Oops, hospital. It's kicking him out, but that he didn't want in. The church is the place, Paul says, where there is the power of Jesus is present. Verse four and five of 1 Corinthians five. The, the, this is what Jesus means with his famous words. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now, <laughs> Bless our hearts, every you know, Bible study that has two or three, we say, I know it's poorly attended, but where two or three are gathered, Jesus is there with us, you know. Uh, it's a bummer, but Jesus is here. And, and that's true. But, but, but the context is, is of, when the church is doing the hardest things of obedience that God is requiring us to do, the, he's not like, well, I'm going to go over there while you do the hard thing. He's there. He moves towards it. His presence, his power are with his people in the midst of costly obedience. And so when people often think of church discipline, they often think of the extravagant cases, right? The times when, when people dig in their heels, not going to budge, and it's ugly, and it's before the whole church, and it's ugly, and did I say it's ugly? Because <laughs> it's ugly. And that's what we think of with church discipline. Now, I would say, um, I would describe that as the highest rung of the, church la- of the ladder of church discipline. And I can think of, in over 10 years of being one of the pastors here, only a few cases of church discipline that have gone or would have gone that far. I say would have gone that far because often things blow apart, particularly when a marriage blows apart, like one or both are gone. But what about the lower rungs of the ladder of church discipline? How often does that occur? I would tell you there's not a single week when this does not happen among us. I feel confident saying that because at least half of the weeks I'm involved in something like this. So I feel like if you guys between the 300 of us are involved in one other week, I, it's confident to say every week this is happening among us. One brother goes to another brother. One sister goes to another sister. One smaller group of people goes to another small group of people and they say something like, I love you, but I'm concerned about this pattern and maybe I'm not seeing it rightly, but I'm worried for you and for us and can we talk more about this? That happens all the time. Praise God. Think what a terrible cauldron of sin and bitterness and gossip, this place would be if no one ever worked things out with each other. Working with one another to make us more holy, that would be awful. Now, do these sorts of conversations happen as much as they should? Do you do them as much as you should? No. 
Do we do them as well as we should, even when we do do them? No. But nonetheless, this is God's plan to help us not lose the plot line of how a holy God redeems an unholy people and causes them to walk in increasing holiness so that one day they can be with him forever in perfect holiness, free from anything and everything unholy, forever. Now we're at the end. There's so much I wanted to say. So much more. I wanted to talk, take to Galatians 6.1, which tells us when we see another in sin, we need to look at our own life. And then as we pursue that person, we do it, the word is gently. I wanted to take us to Hebrews 12, this long passage about how God disciplines us. He does so not as punishment, but as children. Like we're, we're, we're kids he loves. I wanted to do that. And I really wanted to acknowledge the times when church discipline has gone wrong. Remember when I said at the start, hey, just turn to your neighbor and talk about this. (laughs) Why didn't I do that? It's because so many of you have a context for Christians in the church being terrible at this. In fact, you're not going to tell me probably. But the whole time you've just been scoffing at your heart at this sermon because of how hurt you are by the church. Ours or another, or whatever. And I I just can't touch all that. I have to rest in, and I hope you'll let me and us rest in together, that I'm not here to give a comprehensive four-hour seminar on courageous, humble, faithful, God-fearing, people-loving, redemptive church discipline. I'm simply trying to preach one passage, explain it in its context, draw out a little bit of what it means for us, and not lose the gospel plot line within the passage. So that's how I'm going to end. That's how I'll close. With this strange gospel irony of verse 5. And the line about being handed over to Satan. The aim of Satan is surely not redemptive. Admittedly. Satan wants the destruction of flesh and soul. But. 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 How like our God to perform an unlikely plot twist as he accomplishes salvation? Sometimes stories surprise us with plot twists. Thankfully, that's what Jesus is doing all the time. When people and Satan mean something for evil, God turns it for good. Plot twist, wonderful. Consider how the death of a Christian, God makes the promotion to glory. Plot twist. Consider how God the Father makes the crucifixion of the Son of God the very means to offer salvation to all people. Plot twist. The real gospel plot line is beautiful. And even in this one, with being handed over, which means a metaphor for being outside the church, the hope is redemptive. So that a holy God could love an unholy people through the costly death of his son and then cause his children to walk in increasing holiness by the power of the Holy Spirit Until one day, we're with him in the new heavens and the new earth, holy and safe from everything unholy forever. That's the story. Would you pray with me as we close? I'll invite our worship team to lead us in a song. Heavenly Father, I I feel aware every week of all that's left undone. And all that is done is done imperfectly. But I pray in the midst of all of that, you would shine. And the overwhelming, enduring effect would be that you would make us into a people happy and holy with great love for each other and great love for this world. In Jesus' name we pray.